Hey everyone, just a friendly reminder that my channel is primarily ran on stories submitted from my viewers to my email, and there's been an extreme lack of stories that I can use recently and it has contributed to my upload schedule being what it is. Whilst my health is a big problem and it does contribute to that, I can't upload without good stories. If you have a good story that you think could be usable on my channel, please email your story to corpshstories at gmail.com with the subject of the email being what kind of story it is and also include somewhere in the email what alias you'd like to be credited under. I only want true stories and I do vet them, so please don't send anything otherwise, it really just wastes my time. Also, if you're new here from PewDiePie's video I was in recently or any of the streams I've been in, welcome and I'm really happy to have you here. That being said, here are three of the most upvoted Let's Not Meet stories from Reddit. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd basically only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers, we discovered bridges no one went to, we fished, we hid from trains. At night we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times, never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with family in the day, and at night we'd either catch drinks at the bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the good old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our Stand By Me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. And soon we decided to take a day, walk the trails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came and we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside of our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we'd take the opposite direction just to be adventurous. I mean, we knew the land well and we had a map, so I gave a what the hell and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge, sat on the edge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area with trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we weren't actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred feet or so into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill that we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly and as we neared the building we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in, I mean, we didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. 
It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks, go to sleep, and move on at early morning. Night set in and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? The hell is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two when the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. I mean, it was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree. But it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this shit? The light looked to be a candlelight from the way it flickered. And though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit and then it just stopped. After that, a very loud male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the hell out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies. But again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the hell out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our shit, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had came from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was some kids messing around, but I heard those voices, and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. I'm not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. I'll start by saying I have a terrible biological father. He's been a shady person all my life and constantly caused me a lot of grief. This is just one of those examples. When I was four, my parents split up. My mother and I moved states and they agreed I would visit my dad every school holiday for a week. This one particular time I had been with him for a few days when I was playing with my cousin at a nearby park. A car pulled up and I recognized the man as one of my dad's friends. He called me over and without thinking I ran over to him and left my cousin at the park. He asked me if I could show him where my dad lived and I agreed and got in his car. I gave directions and didn't notice at all that they weren't following them correctly. Looking back, I didn't completely really know the way anyhow. After way too long, I did realize that we were getting closer to the city, which is far from my dad's house. We pulled up at a house I didn't recognize and the man told me to wait in the car. 
So I did. At this point, I didn't feel scared at all for some reason. He eventually took me inside, and I definitely started to feel unsafe then. I mainly remember two girls passed out with their tops off, and a much older man was feeling them up everywhere. I made eye contact with this man, and he made me sick to my stomach. I had definitely figured out that this was a bad situation by this point. A lady took me into a bedroom and brought me a sandwich. The bread was stale and I wasn't hungry, but I ate it all because I felt bad for her. Which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what I was thinking about. The lady told me a lot of things I didn't understand, but when she left I remember thinking my dad was coming to pick me up soon. And I fell asleep, waiting for him. I wet the bed that night and no one came to see me the next day until I cried very loudly and banged on the door. The lady came back and yelled at me for stinking up her bedroom and I asked about my dad. She said he was coming tonight after he finished work. She didn't offer me a shower or a bath, so I sat in my soiled pants all day. After that, everything turned into a blur, really. My dad didn't come that night and I was so terrified. In my head, I felt like I was there for months. I thought I was missing school and everyone had forgotten about me. In reality, I was there for five days. They let me take one shower. I don't remember eating much except for boring sandwiches and I had chips and gravy maybe once. Finally, my mom drove across the country to come and get me. After not being able to get a hold of me or my dad for so long and then me missing my pre-booked flight home, she panicked and came looking for me. Thank God she did. She found my dad at his girlfriend's house, methed out completely hiding out. Turns out, he owed a lot of drug money to the people who had taken me. They had told him that they had me, but he couldn't afford it or didn't want me back, whatever it was. He didn't bother to try to get me back. My amazing mom paid his debt for him after borrowing from a lot of people and she came to get me back. I remember when someone came into that room and told me my mom was there and I walked out and I could smell her. It was the best feeling to feel safe again. She took me home and I didn't see my dad again for a long time. She never called the police. My parents' relationship was very complicated then and I fully understand the choices she made. Anyways, I'm definitely okay now. I've spoken about this in therapy and I've come to terms with most of the things that I went through as a child. But still, a very messed up situation for a four-year-old girl to have to be in. So to my dad's friend, the sandwich lady, and even to my dad himself, I hope I never meet you again. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and also having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though, it made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby so I just ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours overtime so I felt pretty tired. Even though I wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and just call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. But he would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9 something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had to open the door and stepped inside. The house had three rooms upstairs. 
Two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both locked, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me just enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at the house though, I mean, I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting into the attic, or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. Thanks for watching and please follow me on Twitter or Instagram so that I don't completely die out when YouTube inevitably kills my channel for not being consistent. Stay safe and have a good day.